Okay, a couple of minutes passed, so I'll start the recording. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the final COGS of this strange semester. Um, very happy to have uh, an old friend of COGS, uh, Hannah de Jagger, here to speak today. Um, Hannah did her DPhil here at Sussex um, on developing the theory of um, uh, participatory, participatory sense making, and she's going to be talking on that today um, in seeing and inviting participation in autistic interactions. Um, I'll take questions at the end, um, and um, if you can put your hands up um, at the end, I'll call on you in the order that you put your hand up. Um, okay, over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Simon. Uh, share screen. There we go. Okay, yes, so I'm very happy to be back at my old alma mater <laughs> after such a long time, even though it's virtual only. And I hope it could be in real life sometime soon as well. That would be really nice, um, as I think we all are hoping for these days, uh, that we could meet again in real life. But anyway, um, yeah, so I will be talking about seeing and inviting participation in autistic interactions. Um, and maybe to just say a few things about uh, what is already on this first slide. Um, autistic interactions, by those I mean interactions of and with autistic people. So the interactions between autistic people and also between autistic and non-autistic people. Um, and the aim, um, of the talk, to put it maybe a little bit provocatively, is to become better for all of us at autistic interacting. Um, and by that, I mean that um, I think there is space for all of us as um, people in general, and also as scientists and researchers, to become more aware of our limitations in interacting with each other. Um, how interactions can go wrong, what kind of miscoordinations and mishaps we all experience in interactions, um, and the effects of, for instance, prejudice on our capacities to interact with each other. Um, so on the one hand, becoming more aware of our limitations in interactions, and on the other hand, also becoming more aware of and open to uh, sophistication and precision and specificity of autistic interactions or rather to say uh, autistic ways of interacting, the, the ways that autistic people already interact or can interact. Um, so non-autistics or neurotypicals, um, especially scientists, uh, researchers of autism and medical professionals or care professionals, um, we have not seen well enough um, the capacities of autistic people to interact because theories are so overwhelmingly deficit-based and in a way also deficit-oriented. Um, and I want to turn that on its head a bit with this research. And it has two concerns in a way, this research. So seeing and inviting participation in autistic interactions has two concerns behind it. One of them is um, to make the lives of autistic people better and to improve just their presence in the world as autistic in their specific ways of being. Um, to make that uh, more possible and better, because that's um, much needed, as they are also indicating quite strongly more and more. But also to make cognitive science better, in a way, because I think cognitive science has missed um, something about human knowing, maybe actually even the, the most important aspect of human knowing, or what makes human knowing precisely human knowing, which is our capacities to connect and our very sophisticated know-how in interactions that we have and in understanding each other um, and the elements of uh, loving in that, I would say, even though that, I mean that quite uh, technically or specifically, but that will hopefully become a little bit more clear during the presentation. Um, so um, if you like, um, I'm just going to move something out of the way here, or no, I can't. Um, what is it? So, if you like, the questions um, behind this paper are 
what does it take to see how autistic people participate in social interactions? Um, to see already their capacities for interacting? And what does it take to invite and support more participation if and when desired? So how can we understand participation better so that we can have more of it? And this if and when desired is important, I think, because this is already one thing that we can learn from autistic people, I think, um, which is that maybe we don't always need to desire or need to participate more. It can also be that a manner of participating somehow is also to not participate or to take a break in participating or to recoil from connection in order to be with yourself and to yeah um yeah self-engage and this, this can enrich participation and is important for participation as well and i think we can learn that from autistic people and also for in for work in an Indian active theory, for instance, the work of Miriam Kiselo on the um, on the inactive self also shows that, which I think is an important message about what participation is, both on the level of interacting and the participation of individu individuals in interactions. Um, uh, so, in a way, um, the large question is maybe, how can we best understand the lived experience of the dynamics of participation so that autism research most benefits autistic people and also everyone's understanding of autism, so that we come in a way to an understanding of autism that that is beneficial for people interacting with each other, and that is, in, their, in that way, a right understanding of autism. And so behind that um, is a wider search for an engaged or even an engaging epistemology in general, but also for understanding autism. And what that is, I will try to explain during the talk as well. So just to give a quick overview of the presentation, um, I will give um, a quick introduction to the run-ups and the run-ins to engaged or even engaging epistemology for autism starting from the concept and the theory of participatory sense-making and also attaching on the recent, more recent development in that theory in the form of linguistic bodies and the theory of an engaged epistemology that I recently wrote about, which I called loving and knowing. And um, I will also mention uh, the role of autistic self-advocacy and the neurodiversity movement and their critiques of the global mental health movement um, in, in uh, which the global mental health movement tries to um, uh, expand an, an, a Western idea of mental health across the whole world. Um, but it's actually quite limited because it is um, not respectful of differences in, in how people understand mental health. Um, and then also I wanted to mention that I'm involved with a charity called Dialogica UK in Sheffield, uh, based in Sheffield that empowers autistic people uh, through participation in um, professional dialogue, which is an, an approach to dialogue based in the, in the research of David Bohm. Um, and this is a, in large part, autistic-led charity. Um, and so uh, what I'm after is to move towards seeing and inviting autistic participation, also via understanding some insights that indigenous epistemologies can teach us about what it means to be human and to participate. And then I wanted to talk about uh, two examples, uh, Gemma Williams' work on talking together and um, Leni van Goitzenhoven and uh, Elisabeth de Schauer's work on swinging together. And then as a conclusion, I would like to say with Audrey Lord that difference is that raw and powerful connection from which our personal power is forged. So it's both about, about difference, about cognition, and how we as interactors and participants fare in recognizing difference and um, connecting across difference, participating across difference. Um, and so also what we can learn about participation from um, engaging with and as autistic researchers. Um, so all of this begins in an active cognitive science in which I was trained very much at the University of Sussex and for which I am grateful every day uh, to this day for my um, um, yeah, training at Sussex. Um, it was very valuable. Um, so the inactive cognitive science approach is, a, is an embodied way of thinking or an embodied school of uh, cognitive science that started 
um, or one of the starting points and a very important one is Varela Thompson and Rush's book, The Embodied Mind, um, of which there was recently a re-edition. And also you can find it in Evan Thompson's work, Mind in Life. Um, it starts from the idea of autopoiesis or it has important roots in the idea of autopoiesis and of sense making and how we make sense of the world in our, through our self-organization and uh, self-maintenance and also our self-distinction from processes that um, we interact with. Um, and these are studied in many intricate ways, still also at Sussex and in many different places. And um, what I did in my PhD at Sussex was to work on participatory sense making. So the, to extend the idea of sense making into the social domain um, by thinking about, um, it, it was in a way a reaction to um, the extreme reduction that happens in psychology and in cognitive science uh, of social, of the idea of social cognition as being able to predict and infer other people's intentions on the basis of theorizing or mentalizing or simulating another person's intentions and then coming to uh, an idea of how to react to another person's behavior or how to interpret it. And thinking about our social capacities as just capa that capacity to me was much too reduced. And so um, I started in my PhD to look at intersubjectivity and it's what I say, what I call its most wide sense, which means everything we do socially in the world. And um, we started thinking about that in terms of how people literally participate in each other's intentions by moving together so that starts from the idea of embodiment, where um, if it's true that when we move and in how we move around in the world, we understand the world, um, then if we can coordinate with each other uh, in our social interactions, when um, uh, processes of interaction emerge between us and can take over the way we interact with each other to an extent, and so interaction processes can be an effective factor in how we um, interact with each other literally on, on many different levels from um, things like heartbeat coordination and synchronization when we do, for instance, mu musical improvisation together, um, all the way up to how we um, uh, also coordinate vocabularies with each other. So for instance, people who come from the same family share certain vocabularies that they don't share with other people. Um, at all these different levels, we synchronize with each other or we coordinate and miscoordinate with each other. And all these levels also interact with each other and there's complexity matching between them as well. So if all that is going on in terms of our individual sense making and coordinations between our sense makings when we interact with each other, then we can speak of literally participating in each other's intentions. Um, and that's how we, we form and transform and modulate and um, yeah, uh, try to preserve meanings and also fight with different meanings by doing these kinds of coordinations with each other's sense-making processes. So that's the idea that was actually developed, as I was just saying to Simon, outside. I mean, I did this in my PhD, but just before finishing the doctorate, I, I remember I was sitting together with Ezekiel outside on the grass between the library square and the office where Simon is sitting now. And then the, the, it all crystallized, in, crystallized into the idea of participatory sense-making, you know, putting together the research on coordination and the sense-making idea from an action became participatory sense-making on the grass there that we can see outside of Simon's window. So that's a, a nice Sussex story to go with this. So that's the origin of participatory sense-making and what it means. Um, and I usually put up this slide to say, that I'm doing this work together with many other people. And I work, if you take participatory sense-making theory to be like a tree, what I'm doing is mainly the conceptual development uh, and on the stem of the tree, if you like, um, with many other people together with them, but also many other people have meanwhile taken it up. And of course there are roots and shoulders that we stand on from many different fields in many different uh, theories that came before um, and are being developed alongside. And also um, the theory is meanwhile already for quite a while being applied and tested in many different fields. And so if we take a top view of the tree and see where the branches lead, we can see that 
um, for instance, in philosophy, um, concepts of ethics and normativity of the self, of autonomy, emergence, uh, intersubjectivity are being developed uh, in conversation with participatory sense making. Um, in psychology, also many different areas are, are engaging with it, um, from development to, uh, to perceptual crossing to education research, even animal psychology. Um, in linguistics, there is also development of this in terms of linguistic coordination and gestural sense making, and I will say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, in neuroscience, there is also um, engagement with this idea through the two-brain two neuroscience or second-person neuroscience. And Ezekiel and I have also proposed the interactive brain hypothesis uh, in relation to neuroscience, um, saying that um, the, the social brain has its, has its origin in interactive experience and interactive skill that we have since very young, even before birth, rather than that, the social brain um, uh, what's the, makes it possible for us to be social. So turning that on its head. And then in sociology and in psychiatry and psych psychopathology, there is also development of these ideas. Um, and in, meanwhile, in, in different fields actually as well, not just academic fields, but also practices in different areas. And what I, I mean, I, met, I kind of developed the theory with, in, with this in mind that it would be able to do this and also to, for the um, results of research in these different areas to feed back into the theory. And in a way what I'm presenting now is, is a development of that. And so one of the developments is the idea of linguistic bodies, which we published with Ezekiel and with Elena Kofari in 2018. Um, and that in that book, what we do is we, um, uh, first of all, extend the inactive theory, theory with a theory of bodies, not just an embodied um, cognitive um, being, but we are many different bodies, all of us. Uh, our living bodies, as well as sensory motor bodies, as well as intersubjective bodies, um, and we maintain uh, our self-organization on all these different levels, and they interact with each other, and so um, there is entanglement and historicity of and between these different bodies that we all are. And when we meet each other, we meet each other also on these different levels. And we also propose that there are linguistic bodies, which are another um, autonomous organization of how we are bodies. Um, we also specify dialectics as a tool for inactivism, and um, we give a model for how to um, go from participatory sense making to a language in which we say that um, several concepts from embodied cognitive science um, need to be worked out further in order to come to an approach to linguistic bodies or to language, which an activism and also embodied cognitive science was previously criticized for not um, going up to the level of language. And so we do work in this book to conceptually go from embodied ideas, which are sometimes considered low level or um, low level capacities that cannot scale up. Um, yeah, and here we, we do that for language. And then we talk also about becoming linguistic bodies or the develop linguistic development um, and yeah, autistic linguistic bodies, which I will also explain a little bit more in a moment. So we have in that book um, a model of language, of languaging, um, of linguistic bodies based on uh, going from the beginning participatory sense making to um, incorporation and incarnation, which are ways in which we regulate and coordinate with each other linguistically through developing social agency in our interaction, not just with others, but with interactive um, uh, normativities um, in ways that can be that or that can and need to be both creative and, um, and spontaneous and regulated. Um, Anyway, there's a lot about that in the book. Um, so I also wanted to mention another aspect of the book that's relevant to this discussion about autistic participation, which is about becoming being and becoming linguistic bodies. And that is that um, even if you talk about becoming linguistic bodies and the, and the development of language, um, there is uh, always full linguistic uh, engagement from the beginning, even an infant who cannot speak yet, um, is addressed with utterances and they are already in contact with the whole of language 
as who they are and with their capacities. And they experience and engage with all the categories of interactive and linguistic skills and forms of agency that we describe in the model because of being taken up in this participation in their way, but with also their specific partners in this. But they are, there's not a piling up of skills, but uh, it's more like an extension of their skills as they uh, are able to participate more and more linguistically. Um, just like sense making is always al already whole at the level at which it is for each person or uh, creature who is doing sense making. Um, and so um, at the same time, full linguistic engagement, which always is like that, is messy. And to become a linguistic body is to continually participate in a linguistic community whose activities and social relations, objects, norms, routines, and so on are all imbued in patterns of languaging that actually influ actively influence development from the start. So, um, yeah, these are some elements of what it means to be a linguistic body. Um, and in all that, in all that work, ongoingly, um, but it's becoming increasingly visible and increasingly strong as a line of research. I think uh, there's an idea. idea that we go towards and that there is a need for an engaged or even an engaging epistemology in order to understand aspects of human knowing that we haven't been able to see so well with um, mainstream or traditional cognitive science. And I will here, I'm just going to explain three uh, collections of ideas very quickly, much too quickly, maybe even to be for it to be well understood. But I want to go into the discussion of autism um, soon. Simon, could I ask you how much time I still have? Because I noticed I, I didn't put a clock in front of me. Um, you, you've got uh, 35 minutes or so. Oh, okay, I will finish before that probably. Great. Um, okay, so um, the first set of ideas that is important here is um, from letting, letting things be via ontological intimacy to loving and knowing. And this is an idea um, about so in order to develop this engaged epistemology and to find out um, um, what human knowing is like, um, maybe I can discuss an example um, from a theorist called Kim McLaren, um, a philosopher at Ryerson University. Um, she talks about how, um, she gives an example of a horse that has not been seen properly by its horse trainer. It's being trained and trained and trained, but it's not, uh, being recognized as a horse and eventually because the horse trainer is training it so hard the, hor the horse breaks down and becomes ill and eventually could even die um, and this is an example according to Kim McLaren that showing that this horse is not known in a good way it hasn't been known by the horse trainer in a good way because this knowing or interacting of the horse trainer with the horse has actually destroyed it so he has not let the horse be. And McLaren says that um, our capacity to know is based on being able to let things be as they are, which uh, in their particular way of being, in their particular being, a horse is a particular uh, creature that we need to let be while we know it or while we interact with it. But this letting be is always done by someone. And this someone, the horse trainer in this case, um, cannot but let it be from their own capacities and from their own preconceptions and from their own motivations and intentions and so on. So she talks about the problem of letting be in epistemology as a balancing act, an ongoing balancing act between what a knower can do in terms of letting the known be, but for this being to be itself, there has to be, and to be known as itself, there has to be a continual movement of balancing between knower and known, and she calls this letting be. And she says that we learn this um, by interacting with other people, or we interact, we, we learn this from interacting with others, so in our intersubjective lives. Um, and she talks in another paper from 2018 about ontological intimacy which she says is um, something that is always the case between people interacting with each other, that 
we are ontologically intimate, which means that we transgress into each other. As we interact with each other, know each other, do things together, educate each other, um, go shopping together, everything people do together, they are ontologically intimate in the sense that they transgress each other's being and change and transform each other. And also um, in a way, impose some, we, we impose some unfreedom in each other when we interact with each other. And she argues that we need to be careful with that um, because uh, yeah, we, we can use that, that transgression into each other badly or, or well in order to, for us to develop as autonomous beings. And then I've connected um, to that the idea of loving and knowing. So to make an engaged epistemology out of that in terms of loving and knowing, I wondered if we want in cognitive science to understand this concept of letting be at the basis of epistemology, I thought we could go um, to an area in our lives where most of us know this tension between being yourself and being in relation well, which is, I think, in loving relationships. And I don't mean by loving just the rosy, romantic uh, simpleness of love as it's understood in popular culture a lot. I mean the existential dialectics um, of the tension between being yourself and being in relation. So actually more the difficult sides of, of loving and being in a loving relationship where you come up against being yourself with another person and the clashes in that and the difficulties in that. And this dialectical, this, this existential dialectic, I think is at play in loving relations and we know it well there and we can research it there. And this also characterizes our knowing relationships where we let each other be and engage with each other and change through that and change each other through that. So that's about an engaging epistemology from that perspective of letting be and how to understand this kind of epistemology. And then the second idea that is at play in this paper is that indigenous epistemologies um, can, can teach cognitive science about human knowing because um, um, I think in traditional mainstream cognitive science, because of its functionalism and its individualism, it is at the basis divisive. Or, so it separates objects that we see from, or it, it, it starts from an idea that objects and subject are separate from each other and how can they come together? And objects are categorized and they are therefore in different boxes and separated from each other. But indigenous epistemologies start from, um, even though they are very varied and there are many different ones, they in general seem to have in common an idea that um, a knower and a known are in relation with each other and change with each other all the time. And so that a knower or, or, or um, a member of society need to develop and be in their own particular being and be in community with their uh, surroundings, human and um, natural surroundings. And in that relationship, um, understand each other. And so that's another um, inspiration for this uh, presentation on autistic participation. Um, and the neurodiversity movement also plays a very important role here because increasingly autistic people are speaking up about how they are and what their experience is and what they expect and need from research in autism. And so they can teach us a lot, I think, about autism, but not only about autism, also about um, being and being with each other in general, I think. So these are very quickly said three inspirations behind this um, talk. So I would maybe say something quickly more about uh, letting be and this different epistemology. So in this approach of letting be, when you let a phenomenon be, um, the phenomenon is always um, in interaction with my knowing the phenomenon. Our, when we know something, there's an interaction between me and the phenomenon that changes us both inevitably. And that's kind of the basic idea of this. And so, just to make it clear, um, letting be in this um, area or realm of epistemology is not um, disengaged or overdetermining. It's not about disengagement. It is actually precisely about engagement and how only in engagement can both an knower and known know each other. But this is 
um, through a paradoxical appro approach where both continually actually change. So we try to grasp something maybe by knowing it, or at least that's our traditional idea, but in doing that, we change it and we ourselves change. That's kind of the basic message of it. Um, yes, and also their relation changes as it goes on. And I connected it to the idea of love or to the experience of loving, um, because this connection, I think, can illuminate that we are deeply involved as particular beings in those we understand who are also particular beings or things or events, and in the process of understanding them. Um, so um, now I would like to talk about uh, participating in autistic interactions and letting autistic people be. Um, so I will discuss very briefly two examples of seeing and inviting autistic participation in autism, in autism research and the implications of that. And doing that, um, seeing and inviting autistic participation in autism research means that we need to do justice to the three elements of participation. And maybe this wasn't yet clear from what I've explained so far, but the three elements of participation are always those who participate. So in the minimal case, it's two. So that's two elements. Um, and they come with their sense makings, their needs, capacities, struggles, constraints, and so on. And the dynamic that emerges between, between them and which makes them into participants. So these three elements need to all um, be taken into account. Um, so it means that we need to study the interaction dynamics, uh, the lived experience of interacting and how everyone is situated and embodied in these interactions whether they are daily life interactions or research interactions, and what the impacts and consequences are of how we are situated and how everyone participates and what the relationship is doing. Um, so oh yeah, I will give three examples actually. So in the Linguistic Bodies book, um, we gave a few hypotheses, two hypotheses of autistic linguistic participation based on the model that we proposed. And these, it would be really nice if they could be worked out at some at some point by someone. And I, probably there is already research that also um, supports them or, or gives some further insight into them or specifies them more. But the first hypothesis is that autistic people tend to over and under regulate interaction and participation dynamics. So maybe with an example, there is this uh, joke that uh, Peter Vermeulen mentions in one of his early books, which is that uh, someone asks an autistic person at dinner, can you pass the salt? And the person says, yes, and that's it, they don't. So they, they under-regulate the interaction dynamics by just responding to the literal question, but not by the invitation to be giving the salt to the other person. So they uh, under or over-regulate interaction and participation dynamics in different ways. Um, and also, autistic people tend to braid threads of utterances that move through, through conversations, not only one uh, um, conversation ongoing now, but maybe also the history of conversations that led to this particular one. They braid threads of utterances and their meanings differently. And sometimes they make up on the pragmatics of an interaction or of an utterance, but not so much on the expressiveness of the utterance. So maybe how a person is being present in such a conversation. And in the book, we describe also some examples from research that illustrate this. And then I wanted to briefly mention this work by Gemma Williams, who I think is in the audience today. Um, she, for her PhD work, she investigated um, the conversations of autistic and non-autistic interaction partners around the topic of loneliness in Brighton. Um, and um, this research was she, was, she was gathering conversational data um, uh, to, on this topic, but also between autistic and non-autistic interaction partners, so about that. But of course, the topic was very meaningful to the people involved in the interaction. And this led her to write, um, I think in her thesis, but also in this article, in a critical way about participatory autism research, which needs to actually have an impact for the people who are involved in it. And it can't just be um, 
remote research that just gives some results, but here actually it led to changes in the lives of the people who participated in this research. And she um, considers that as, a, as an important, uh, maybe very important outcome of this kind of research. And I think that's very welcome and very well done and um, yeah, important that we see all these layers of how people interact and that as researchers, when we interact with people, we have responsibility to how they will be able to go on interacting uh, in and through and after this research as well. Um, and then another example very recent as well is from uh, Van Goetzenhoven and the Schauer um, about swinging together. Um, this is about um, the making of a video and the video is called Swinging Together. Um, it's an artistic participatory research project around a girl called Helene um, where the researchers uh, wanted to make this video and they also about this this particular activity that Helene who is a nonverbal autistic woman young woman engages in which is swinging she really loves swinging and the researchers start to engage with her by going to the swing and and swinging together and they try to find out Helene's ways of communicating even though almost all of these ways of communicating that she has are non-conventional and the paper is about um, how they go about uh, connecting with her and with the people around her so that this way of communicating of Helene can come out in its most um, um, opposite way that, that brings in Helene as a full participant of this research, but also of what she is capable of in her life, even though it's non-traditional or and therefore not easy to pick up sometimes the different ways in which she can communicate. So, um, just and these are just two pieces of research like that. I could give this talk 50 times and present two different pieces of research like that uh, each time, which is very nice, I think. There is definitely a lot of sensitivity in this kind of research already going on. And so I'm trying to pr provide a framework, if you like, one way of looking at it that might help bring out its messages or, or connect with it in an interesting way philosophically. So as some concluding thoughts, um, just three more slides. Um, and now I could wish, I wish I could move this Zoom thing out of the way, but my mouse isn't working. So <laughs> I hope I can read it anyway. Um, these are some quotes from the actual paper. So it's not because we are able to be scholars that we are, um, oh, sorry, I, need, I do need to get this thing out of the way. <laughs> One moment, uh, like this, yes. I hope, yeah, okay. Um, so uh, this is a quote from a feminist researcher. She says, um, it is not because we are able to be scholars that we are positioned to develop knowledge of marginalized others. No, it is because of how we are positioned in relation to marginalized others that we are able to be scholars. And this is something really to think about a lot. I think, I mean, yeah. Standing next to people and um, speaking with them from shared humanity, I think is what this is about um, as scholars also. I mean, we tend to, we have a habit of objectifying or remotely looking and then thinking we are scholars, but this is putting this on its head and saying, no, we have to engage in gathering knowledge together and then we can be scholars. And I, yeah, I think that's a message that needs to go very deep um, and then Katz and Schotter, Arlene Katz, um, put it like this, in this kind of research, um, the problems facing us are solved, not by giving new information, but by us going on with each other in a new way. So that's also another way to phrase what this research do can do, I think. So to repeat the point, um, knower and known are existentially engaged, and each of their beings and becomings are implicated in this epistemological relation between them, which is therefore always also an ethical and an ontological relation. Um, and so in knowing, aut knowing autism as scientists, as doctors, as teachers, and so on, and knowing autistic people as friends, neighbors, family members, we also know ourselves inevitably. And, we, and the same goes also for autistic people knowing others. In knowing each other, we know ourselves, 
also, and that's important. And maybe that autistic people are also doing that is something that we need to see more clearly. So a participation between autistic and non-autistic people that lets each one be and become should also be the basis for scientific and medical approaches to autism. And so I think the road or a better road to better science and to better understanding lies in sensitively moving into and out of what emerges between us. And the inactive approach um, in conversation with indigenous feminist decolonial and neurodiverse epistemologies can support and ground this, I think. And we should be careful with our cognitive theories because um, because and for how they reflect back on us as well as human beings and as scientists, because they change us as well. So within the interdependence of mutual, that is non-dominant differences, lies that security which enables us to descend into the chaos of knowledge, maybe the ongoing becoming of knowledge and of each other, and return with true visions of our future, along with the concomitant power to affect those changes which can bring that future into being. So Audrey Lord says, difference is that raw and powerful connection from which our personal power is forged. And so an engaged epistemology does not mean that we will or have to know each other exhaustively. It does mean um, that knowing each other will never be finished, in fact, because each of us keep on developing, we keep on becoming both apart and in relation to each other. And this is why this is not just an engaged, but an engaging epistemology, because it engages us as well. And in this way, the insight at the heart of participatory sense making can be deepened, I think, the, the insight that was there from the beginning, but that needs to be deepened, namely that Engaging with each other means to stand on one's own ground, each of us, whether an autistic or non-autistic person in this case, and from there to engage in social interactions, which will entail breakdowns, repairs and transformations of oneself and of the relationship. And this is engaged knowing. And here are some uh, references. That's the end of the talk. Great. Thank you, Hannah. That's a um, very interesting, engaging talk. Um, so um, I'll take questions now. If you, if you could raise your virtual hand, it'll tell me um, who raised it first. Um, Simon. Oh, thank you very much, Hannah. That was, um, yeah, that was really interesting. Um, I guess I wanted to raise a, a concern regarding this idea of letting things be, yeah. um, which is that it seems to me like it, it, it's related in some way to the kind of the notion of things being normal yeah. in a way where the theorist imports their own normative preferences into a framework under the guise of it just being a kind of objective or you know, unbiased description of how things are. You know, why can't the horse trainer just let the horse be a stressed and sick horse that is going to die? Mm. You know, why? Wh what's, it seems like there are some choices being made about what it is to let a thing be itself that mm. are not to do, if you like, with objective scientific judgments, but to do with normative judgments on the part mm. of the theorist. Yeah. And that's the question. <laughs> I mean, so I guess the question is what, like, do you think that there's any validity to that concern? Um, I think it's impossible to ever ask a question outside of such, uh, outside of a normative, normative framework. It's unavoidable that there is a normative framework. So in the case of the horse trainer, he wants to make money with the horse, right? The horse serves a purpose for him. And from that purpose, he interacts with the horse, but he gets it completely wrong because he, he bypasses the needs of the horse with his purpose. But, but if, his, if his purpose was to drive the horse to death, then he would be letting it be in the right way. Um, yeah, he would. Yeah. And actually, th there is some interesting work in a, in a book by Eduardo Cohn that re it reminds me of that. And people have asked me this question before. 
Um, he talks about it's it's he's an anthropologist, I think, and he talks about um, people. I think it's in Guatemala or uh, or in Ecuador who interact with creatures in the forest. And one thing they do is kill them for food, of course. And they he describes how, in a way, they are hunting wild pigs, and they love the wild pig in order to think like and with the wild pig to know where it's going to be and how it reacts and so on in order to kill it. So yes, in a way, letting it be for that purpose uh, of killing it um, when it's done well is a is a way of I mean uh, is a way of 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 yeah letting it be. Um, but yeah, yes. And then I immediately think about um, how industrialized societies make get their meat food um, by effectively killing animals, but um, maybe not letting them be like the hunters in, in Latin America or in, in Ecuador or Guatemala do it. And the role of, for instance, Temple Grandin in designing um, uh, livestock um, facilities so that it's better for the animals, so that they are less stressed and so on. But still, it's about killing them for food. So the, and But this points precisely to the tensions in knowing, I think, that are unavoidable. Uh, tensions in these norms that clash or that go together at some level, but then clash on another level, because in these examples, you're still killing a creature. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, Nothing in the world, I think, ever doesn't kill other things. Um, <laughs> which, yeah. So, but it's this points to these tensions, and that's precisely what is at the heart of this, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, Nicola. Yeah. Uh, hi, Hannah. Um, yeah, Hannah. So you were talking about participatory research, um, and some of the things you talk about remind me very much of things that I see. So if I'm talking to or, you know, listening to a parent talking about their nonverbal autistic child um, or going to a school and watching the teachers interact. With, so I'm talking about autistic people who, would, who don't speak. Um, mm -hmm. I see lots of things that they seem to be doing to have, you know, to have some kind of coordination um, with that person so you know the, and they're very individual things so I was talking to a parent recently and they were talking about ways that sometimes they just sway together mm -hmm. um, so nobody decides that they're going to do that they just they just kind of do it um, and you know there are therapies like intensive interaction which are very much about following the lead mm -hmm. um, uh, so, the, so the parent or the teacher following the lead of the autistic person. So mm -hmm. I just wonder what you think about that, because to me, you know, that strikes me as somebody who's really understanding or doing that, letting it be or whatever. What's your view about that? Because those are not, you know, they're not in the position of a scientist. Yeah, I think so, sometimes practitioners know letting be better than scientists do. Oh, assuredly. I mean, better. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I would acknowledge that. So what's my position in watching those interactions from the outside? Um, the scientists. Yeah. Well, I think to begin with, um, you recognizing them as a letting be happening between them is already a big step compared to uh, ways that we understood autism before, which would say that those ways of understanding, aut I mean, or maybe theory of mind theorists wouldn't be interested in those ways of for people with autism or autistic people and their caregivers or, or, or family members to interact with each other. They wouldn't recognize that as important aspects of me making sense together. So as, a sci as scientists and as observers, we can see, I think, or we can train ourselves or become more sensitive to what what would be a letting be interaction. Um, and we need to better understand it for that and in order to be seeing it more. But also, as we just said, often practitioners are naturally in some sense better at it so they can teach us about how to see it and how it manifests, I think. And I think as scientists listening or in listening to and engaging with practitioners, 
and with autistic people themselves um, is really crucial in this to be able to do that more and more and to see more and more of what actually is going on in interactions that is um, valuable yeah okay thanks thanks <laughs> Any more? Um, I, I was wondering, honey, um, you know, the the theory of mind type idea in, in, in autism and um, your your view. Um, how much conflict conflict is there there, or, or do you think that they can be accommodated? No, I don't think they can be com accommodated. Um, no. Um, The theory of mind view begins from and manifests in different levels, a division between people. I mean, it starts from how we do not know each other uh, or how we have no connection with each other and how we could bridge this giant uh, schism between each other um, in our heads. Um, it doesn't have an account of connection or of interaction. It doesn't like take that seriously, unless a lot has changed since I started studying it in the beginning of my PhD. But um, I, actually, I haven't thought about it for a long time. But no, I yeah, I don't see a connection between it and what I'm trying to say, except that it's very much not what I'm trying to say. And I expect that they would say the same about my approach. <laughs> Um, it's a difficult question. I, I I need to put myself in a different frame of mind to maybe to to give more of an answer to it. Um, yeah, the theory of mind also begins from the fact that people deceive. You know, the tests of it are that people deceive each other and such things. I think it's even morally problematic that theory. <laughs> From its grounds and yeah. Yeah. It's seeking connection but not able to reach it. I think. Lift connection. I suppose your idea has got more in does it have more in similarity with the, the simulationist approach? Or is that still too much of a separation? Yeah, I think the simulationist approach starts from the same starting point that we don't know each other and that we would have to go into another person's mind and 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 place ourselves either in their shoes or 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 bring what they are thinking into our uh, transpose it into our being or into our starting points in some way and in a way what happens in between that with in between us putting ourselves in the other person's shoes or transporting transposing what they are thinking into our situation, what happens in between that is not thematized or how that happens is not thematized um, or at least not in terms of connection. Yeah. Maybe someone else wants to chip in on that. <laughs> Gemma, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I think you're on mute. Just have my headphones on, sorry. There are the children screaming outside. Um, <laughs> I love the talk, thank you. Um, I, yeah, I wonder if maybe um, what, what your account offers that's different to and in conflict with theory of mind is that it has a much more embodied mm. element, like it takes into account the, yeah. the, the body and the embodiedness of, of, a, of a being. Yeah. The yeah, that's true. That's a good point. The, yeah, in the theory of mind, there is no embodiment. It's all about propositions and brains and and what brains do. Um, yes, and there's no body. That's true. Yeah, I had forgotten that starting point. Yeah, because it's so basic in a way. But that's very true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice room. <laughs> uh, Nicola. 
Yeah, sorry, uh, Hannah, this is not a very well formulated question. So I'm sorry, I'll say that in advance. Um, so just thinking about um, interaction. So a verbal neurotypical adult um, communicating with a nonverbal autistic child, um, you know, because we've been doing, we've been trying to do that with this, these apps that we've got where we try to get children to recognize that there's a contingency between their actions. Um, mm -hmm. So when you first do that, similar to intensive interaction, where, you know, basically you've got two people and there doesn't seem to be any connection between them at all. There's no recognition of a connection. The adult does. So it's a very unbalanced um, interaction. So basically the adult always has to follow what the child's doing until a point when you think, oh, the child has clicked that yeah. there's a relationship between your two behaviors. Um, and so then you want to move on to something that's more balanced. So I'm trying to think about it in terms of your, you know, so your let it be thing, that's both sides of the interaction, isn't it? Yeah. So, so yeah. is that, would you see yeah. that as something that mm -hmm. is, you know, th that would be a more participatory interaction if that's better balanced? Uh, if both of them are able to let be. Yeah, probably the interaction comes to be or, or can can take off or can take on a life of its own when both are present and ready for participation. And it might be for in those kinds of interactions that you've just described that that takes a while before that happens or that can get off the ground. Yeah, for sure. And I do think it's also true, like you say, or seem to say that we can recognize that or that there is a point where that happens or begins or, or where that opening comes to be in the interaction um, where from then on yeah. they can connect. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's that it, you mentioned Tom Froza and it very much makes yeah. me think of his work about yeah. contingency, you know, yeah. recognizing that there's another agent there. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Because, you know, because for some interactions that doesn't happen. Well, yeah. if you can call that an interaction. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the difficulties about that communication yeah. um, with people who, don't have verbal communication and don't appear to show contingent yeah. action yes yeah, yeah. and we, we can of course we can see or measure also the dynamic signature of such interactions and we we should be able to to say here it's not yet an interaction because there is no i mean according to our definition of interaction it wouldn't be one if there is no yeah. regulation between them Right. And then at some point it does become that, and then it could also move into and out of that again, and this will have a dynamic signature. But it's also possible between a nonverbal and a verbal person that this happens at a level where we aren't yet expecting it or we can't so easily see it or measure it, and it might yet be there. Um, in some, yeah, for yeah. instance, in music improvisation, yeah. it's shown that heartbeats can coordinate, but. It's, that would, for instance, happen, I think, when there is coordination in terms of both making music or yeah, using an instrument or something, um, yeah. which is not the same as what you said when it's not yet happening. But yeah, yeah. We, I think yeah, we need to be able to measure it on these different levels. So on the different bodies that are interacting with each other, our different bodies that are interacting with each other, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Stavros. You're muted. Rookie mistake. Um, and thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, I'm quite new to this framework, but it seems really uh, its importance already strikes me. Um, in terms of a lot of the, in terms of modeling, uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of work on, uh, you know, uh, you know, Bayesian causal modeling and how theory of mind might work. Yeah. And a lot of it's based on the, so, you know, predictive processing, Bayesian brain kind of stuff, which is also a pretty popular uh, at Sussex. I don't know if that's, if it's for better or for worse, but it is. Um, and I was wondering in terms of um, more of a participatory sense-making uh, modeling approach, I mean, to me, what you described with letting be and sort of like these dynamic interactions, it struck me as a, um, I actually have uh, the cybernetic brain by Andrew Pickering next to me, which he sort of talks about how, um, you know, so cybernetics is performance and sort of, you know, uh, sort of interacting with this black box and then seeing how it interacts rather than sort of guessing at its inner workings. Yeah. 
And I was wondering, should I guess to model this kind of approach, would we have to take sort of a cybernetic kind of approach? I mean, maybe I don't understand the framework well, but that's kind of, I was wondering if you could expand a little on that. Oh yeah, cybernetics has, is, hasn't been in my head so much since my time at Sussex, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so to jump to that. Um, Yes, I mean, uh, yes, and in the when I was there, there were many people doing that kind of modeling interaction. Ezekiel did that in his PhD thesis, modeling interactions like that, and also many other people who were then just finished with their PhD or doing it at that time, like Tom as well, Tom Friese. Um, yes, so definitely, yeah. But I have to try to remember what the specifics are of cybernetic approaches in modeling in order to answer that question in more detail. And I'm having difficulty bringing that to the forefront. No problem. Uh, thanks for directing me to the work. I'll definitely take a look. Yeah, it's definitely about self systems that self-organize and then get interaction in interaction with each other. And that would be um, yeah, a starting point for modeling this. And there are models of these kinds of interactions. Uh, for instance, you can look at perceptual crossing models, mm -hmm. the, the perceptual yeah, crossing uh, paradigm and models of it done by Tom Fröse and also by Hiro Izuka, who was also at Sussex for a while as a visiting scholar. Um, yeah, those could be things to look at. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I, I'm wondering if and um, thinking about embodied interaction, uh, how, how much work has been done on interaction over Zoom and whether teaching and and that kind of thing, how it's affected by, by doing it like this? Yeah, I think there are things, I, I regularly see things passing by where people are looking at it. And actually with a PhD student that Ezekiel and I share or that we both supervise together, we just um, wrote a paper on the transition from life um, interactions in psychotherapy to Zoom interactions or to virtual interactions and what the transition does mm -hmm. and how that changes in, in embodiment and how much, um, you know, the visual is now focused on and, and uh, the, um, so the visual channel is very important and the other ones are much less important. And also even the, the importance on, and the effect of um, being in your own home when you are in an interaction with a therapist and uh, the absence of going to the psychotherapy room and afterwards going away from it, the transition that comes with that. So it's not just the embodiment, but you know, also in a wider sense, the embodiment, the situatedness and the, and the place and going to a place and going away from it. And yeah, mm -hmm. and the, the importance of silences and how they change in, uh, yeah, in between Zoom and like uh, Nikolai, in your project, you call it Zoom or Room. I think that's such a great title, yeah. Zoom or Room differences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Nikolai has a new project on that. Hmm. Nikolai? Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say that is, and in fact, Devin and I, Devin's, yeah, Devin is here um, still. Yeah, uh, we, we've been looking at video this morning of the same people doing therapeutic intervention oh. Um, so one of the things we're looking at in the videos is looking at that connectedness. And it's mm. so one of our questions is how do we best get that, you know, measure that sense of connectedness? Um, and actually, it's interesting because alongside it, we're doing some surveys and things and talking to school children about what it was like when they were doing remote learning and things. And actually, a connection is something that they talk about. So they'll say, well, I saw my teacher, but I didn't really feel connected or I didn't feel connected to my friends. So mm -hmm. it's that, it, you know, so it's it's trying to look at what that means to yeah. be connected and whether you can feel it in an online interaction the yeah. same. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is there's a lot of potential confounding factors in those things that, um, you know, or, or, you know, developmental, you know, affects things that change over time. And, yeah. you know, so there's, yeah, yeah. we've got, not very many videos and lots of potential differences in no. why people might be connected but yeah it's mm. yeah it's a crucial question yeah 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 i agree yeah zoom silence is <laughs> important yeah Gemma. Hey, again um yeah i, I just wonder whether um you have any sense of how 
your the approach that you're describing um, in terms of inviting participation in you know, autistic interactions, how that might be kind of condensed into sort of simple, I don't know, parameters or advice or mechanisms for mm -hmm. supporting interactions, you know, in could be in schools with children or in, um, in the mm -hmm. workplace or engaging with health services, you know, wh where there are those kind of neurodiverse interactions happening. Mm -hmm. You mean advice or? Yeah, like, so how to translate the, this yeah. approach into kind of practical, practical terms for everyday people. Yeah, that's difficult. <laughs> I mean, I realize that even though I think I'm talking about something very simple and something that everybody knows, it's still the way I'm trained to think about it over such a long time means that it's hard to speak with lay people in terms that they understand. I think I do, but they don't think so often. And that's that's in a way a pity uh, because I think that's very important to be able to do that, to make that connection and to, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I don't really actually know. Uh, yeah, it's a difficult question. <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't meant to be a trick question. I just wondered if, no. you, if you had any thoughts, you know. No, no, I think it's a genuine question. I, I, I agree with you actually that, that, that it is a, an important question. And it's what I'm trying to work towards, but I, I notice that it's a skill to do that kind of communication, to communicate this kind of theory to let's say lay people is is a yeah a skill that i'm trying to develop but it's taking me a long time <laughs> um yeah well lisa um, just commented in the inner chat that um she's a lay person and she thinks um you convey your ideas beautifully ah okay <laughs> nice <laughs> that's cool yeah some people do get it i mean I, I do sometimes also get reactions of people who say that um it accords with their experience and that they uh, find it useful for that reason. So some people do get it in the way that I speak about it, but not everybody does. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there's still something in my communication that I can change, but it's different from an academic communication. Yeah. And I, I, I realize that the gap can be very wide, unexpectedly so, yeah. but that's a nice feedback. Was that in the chat? I didn't see it. Yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah, Sophie. Hi there. Thank you, Hannah. That was so, so interesting. Um, I've just got a question about something that you mentioned right at the start, which was about um, um, the manner of participation, I think you spoke about, and being with yourself, and how that can enrich the time when you're actually sort of actively participating. Um, and I was just wondering if there was sort of more on that in that, you know, often we can sort of separate, you know, they're sort of, yeah, being on our own or being with others, and it becomes another division. But whether that sort of um, time or energy or space when you're on your own, is it just about consolidating and feeding that participatory process? Or is it more than that? And perhaps how can it be part of a sort of larger model if it, if it is really important? I don't know. And I think, you know, for sort of autistic people as well, that, that could be quite interesting to sort of explore that time and space a bit more. Of being with yourself. Yeah, yeah but not in isolation of the fact that it's about sort of participation, yeah, if yeah. that makes sense. Does that, I don't know if I explained that well enough. Yeah, I think it's about the balance between being with yourself and being in interaction, mm -hmm. even maybe while an, a participation is going on. <laughs> Actually, as you were saying that, I was uh, becoming again conscious of something that I've become conscious of a few times in this in this situation now, this, this um, conversation, which is that I'm quite nervous. And so I feel that in my body. And I, I, can, I think I can feel what it does to my face and makes it not so natural, perhaps. Or, and then I feel, okay, what can I do to change that? And maybe then I feel like I need to sink into my body more to try to, to, to lose some of those nerves and therefore to be better able to participate. And I think that's an example of, of um, this balancing between participation and being with yourself, which we can do and maybe could do more together 
or um, ongoingly both, but we have to give each other space and time for that maybe, and also ourselves, because I think it requires maybe often um, something more slow in interaction or giving space to silences in interaction. Another example of it is in the Dialogica um, charity that I'm part of, um, we have, we organize these um, um, facilitated professional dialogues in which people participate. And um, since it's with autistic people, we um, installed as one of the practices that we leave silence between one speaker and the next um, in order for people to gather their thoughts. And I think that's, that's geared towards the autistic participants, but actually everybody benefits from it. Um, yeah, that kind of a little bit more rest, I think, in, in, in engagements and exchanges would be welcome and helps everyone. It's not always necessary or appropriate, but sometimes it, um, yeah, it can work on a lot of levels. Yeah, I agree. And that sort of reflective process can be done in participation with others, just the way you say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. <laughs> Nicola? Yeah. Um, sorry to ask so many questions, I know I'll make so many points, but yeah, just based on what Sophie's just said, um, that difference between uh, being online and in person is so crucial for your theory, really, because it's about that embodiment. I mean, I just remember that one, um, I mean, I, I wrote this for, a, I did a blog post on this, that I was talking to a lot of um, like pediatric neuropsychology people, because they're having to do things like, you know, autism diagnostic assessments, and all sorts of things are being done online. It's like, how can we do yeah. this in the same way? And um, uh, one said, oh, they don't know, we've got legs, because you always have yeah. this kind of, you know, top yeah just a face um you know and they talk about things like suddenly they're in that person's home and you know they can see the people in the background and how those people are interacting and how different they are um and um so it's 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 a really for your theory it's a really fantastic situation because it's very much about when you're not embodied there you you know so that thing about leaving silences that's one of the things i found really hard in zoom uh you know when i'm having like a lab meeting or something um which i know if i was in the room we could have a silence and actually simon referred to that so it's you know it's whether it's just because you know there's a new medium so there's some new you have to work out some new ways of of being with other people um but those things like silence in particular are quite difficult so i guess that's you know for your it's a kind of um yeah it's a case for looking at your theory i think oh, yeah it might be considered a kind of litmus test for it but i do think we are still very embodied and i mean and the fact that we are just heads and shoulders almost no shoulders or even some hands here and there um you know all of that um, that absence is present of that um, and makes itself felt and becomes, you know, takes on its significance and we can learn from that. And of course, we are still voices and movement and faces and, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's not like it's completely disappeared or like it's disappeared at all, actually, I would say. It's just different. Yeah. Thanks. In particular ways with yeah. particular implications. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. The silences always um, <laughs> made me think of which why I don't really like telephone conversations because I find the silences very awkward. Whereas yeah. um, in a room with people, we can all stare at the same thing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But over the phone, you can each stare at a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> Might be even, I don't know, more relaxed. I don't know. Mm. But even just thinking that there is that possibility over Zoom or on the phone, just allowing it for yourself yeah. um, might make a difference. And even saying it. Uh, oh, I think if, yeah, if everyone said, I might, I might have some silences, don't worry. Um, yeah. That would be yes. helpful. Stevie, yeah. And you're silent. Um, if, there's, um, if there's no other questions, this is a bit more of a general one. Um, 
in terms of, I've asked this question at Cogs before, um, and it's essentially, so you've taken a different approach, uh, especially now uh, for this talk in the uh, field of autism research. Um, in terms of sort of like your background and maybe how interdis inter interdisciplinary it is, I'm, I'm guessing, um, and also the sort of barriers you faced uh, trying to push like such a new idea uh, coming from such a different approach. Like, uh, how did you find that? Like, what were the difficulties? What were the things you came up against? And uh, how did you overcome them to get where you are today? Yeah, well, big question. Mm. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so one difficulty that I sometimes encounter, which I mean, I was almost thinking there are no difficulties, but I'm sure that's a mistake. <laughs> I don't think that's true, um, but um, maybe they don't come to mind. But one difficulty that I, I sometimes encounter is that um, people who are definitely cognitivist and, and therefore also individualist and functionalist who are working within those kinds of theories demand of me to answer any question they have in their framework. And if I don't answer it in that way, I haven't answered the question. And then I always have to say, no, actually we stand on different grounds and I cannot answer your question in your framework because then I wouldn't, you know, th that goes away from my ground. And so I don't have anything to say from my perspective to that question. And that's even, um, you know, it's 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 not groundwork, but it's like root work in a way, or to 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 make people understand that there are actually um, different paradigms or different viewpoints, and that that should be respected in a way. Sometimes when people come to me with these kinds of questions, you know, they start asking me about representations, and are there really no representations, or they ask intricate questions about representations, and then I have to say. Uh, that's not where I stand. And so I cannot answer those questions within what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, just to make sure that there is space for doing the work within the inactive framework or on the inactive ground. And I, I, what I sometimes have to do is claim space or broaden my shoulders in a way and say, no, I'm working here in the inactive framework and I'm going to stay here because here's where I think I need to go deeper together with my colleagues and we have to develop this in terms of the phenomenology, what's happening when you take this worldview and also in terms of how can we understand it and explain it and yeah, move forward in it. But on this ground, not on a cognitivist ground and also often not trying to bridge between the two paradigms because sometimes I find, this is not the same for other people, but I find that that is too distracting and and I think there's enough valuable work to do within the inactive framework. And there are definitely good people who, and theorists who try to make bridges or who try to um, make concepts from one paradigm to the other understandable or, or, or do cross paradigm criticisms, but that's not really so much my focus. That's one way I could answer this question. Thank you very much. Mm. I mean, if there are no more questions, I think that that's that's a, a nice sort of general point on on which to end it. Um, so thank you very much again, Hannah, for a fascinating mm -hmm. talk. Thank you for having me, and thanks to everybody for your really nice questions. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> good. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming, and um, have a good break, and hopefully see you all again um, in the new year. Mm -hmm. when the world's going to be all normal again. <laughs> or better. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.